Good evening, everyone, and welcome every to tonight's webinar on cognitive health in cats and dogs. I'm Dr. Kelly Deal, the Senior Director of Science Communic Communication at Morse Animal Foundation. And I'm so glad that you're here. Our organization, as you probably saw on the slides that we're going through just now, is based here in Denver, and we've been funding research to benefit animal health for 75 years. It's amazing. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. We're so glad again that you could join us because we've got two wonderful speakers tonight, Dr. Star Cameron, Dr. Michael Kahn. Dr. Cameron will be starting us off with a discussion about cats and cognitive health. And then we'll go to Dr. Michael Kahn who will talk about cognitive issues in dogs. A quick bit of housekeeping for everyone before we get started. Please use the Q&A function if you have any questions, including any technical issues you might have, such as sound or video issues. We have a team who will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll do our best to help. In addition, I'll be actually watching those questions and curating them as they come in and we'll save them for our live Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Also, for those of you who submitted questions ahead of time, I have read all of those ahead of the lectures, and we'll be weaving those questions in as well at the end of the program. I really hope you enjoy tonight's webinar, and we'll start now with Dr. Cameron. Dr. Starr Cameron received her veterinary degree from the Royal Veterinary College in London, England, and then completed a one-year rotating internship at Pittsburgh Veterinary Specialty and Emergency Center. In 2013, she finished her residency in neurology and neurosurgery at Cornell University and became a board-certified veterinary neurologist and neurosurgeon. After residency, Dr. Cameron moved west to the San Francisco Bay Area and worked full-time in private practice at Sage Veterinary Specialty and Emergency Centers in Redwood City, California. It was during this time she also worked uh, part-time as a postdoc in the Comparative Neuroscience Laboratory at Stanford University studying epilepsy and sea lions. In 2017, Dr. Cameron joined the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine and later in 2021 completed a master's degree in clinical research. Dr. Cameron is a clinical associate professor at UW-Madison um, School of Veterinary Medicine, and her research interests include seizures, translational models, and cognitive dysfunction in dogs and cats. And she lives in Madison with her husband, new infant son, born last September, congratulations, Star, dog and two cats. So welcome, Star. Thanks for joining us on the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I um, always start by asking people a little bit about their personal journey to becoming a veterinarian, and then what led you to specialize in neurology? Yeah, so I actually decided that I wanted to become a veterinarian a little later than most uh, people do. So actually, it was during my sophomore year of my undergraduate degree. Prior to that, I actually wanted to study animal behavior and was double majoring in biology and psychology and was also working part-time in a um, veterinary laboratory running heartworm tests that was connected to a veterinary emergency clinic. And that's where I found my true calling, uh, being and witnessing and, and being part of that team. I eventually became a, a veterinary assistant and veterinary technician. And that's um, when I decided that I, I wanted to become a veterinarian. With that background in psychology, specifically neuroscience, it made sense once I was in vet school that I always perked up for the neurology lab lectures, whether it was anatomy or physiology or clinical neurology, uh, I was always extremely interested in those topics. And so specializing in neurology and becoming a neurologist seemed like a natural, <laughs> natural path. So what do veterinary neurologists do? I think there are probably people out there who are thinking of human neurologists, but kind of what do, what do veterinarians who specialize in neurology, what, what does your day look like? Great question. So we study the brain, the spinal cord, and then the nerves that innervate muscles as well. And so we're not a behaviorist, though those exist, veterinary behaviorists. We're not a, a therapist or a psychologist or anything <laughs> like that, but we're actually studying the, the brain and the spinal cord. So a lot of the, the more common diseases that we see are seizures or encephalitis, disc herniations. So when dogs have trouble walking and then, uh, 
things like feline cognitive dysfunction. We see that as well. So they kind of dovetail, but you uh, already talked about this, but what led you to also tie in the animal behavior piece to your yeah. clinic? So I, I ended up in this line of, of research at, from a couple of, of things. One, I love cats <laughs> um, and have been studying seizures in cats for a number of years now. And then also behavior comes from the brain. And so a lot of times when clients bring their, their pets to us and they have a behavioral problem, part of my job is trying to decide, is it uh, another medical condition? Let's take something like urinating outside of the litter box. Okay, is that uh, a problem such as a urinary tract infection, something related completely you know, to the kidneys or the bladder? Is that a behavioral issue? Is the cat urinating outside because something's changed in the environment or the cat uh, has a behavioral problem that, that's come up? Or is it related to a neurologic issue? Uh, is there a problem with that learned behavior in the, the fact the cat has learned to go to the bathroom in the litter box and they are not remembering how to do that. So uh, animal behavior is, is quite tied into neurology and part of my job is teasing those out and trying to determine where the problem is. All right. So um, I think we have this image of like the crazy cat, but, ser but, you know, being serious, how do you define like cognitive dysfunction in cats? Like, what does that look like exactly? Great question. So uh, as we all age, we have normal aging process. And unfortunately, that affects every part of our body, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that's normal aging. But when we're talking about cognitive dysfunction, we're talking about an accelerated uh, problem specifically within the brain. And usually that looks like problems with learning, problems with memory, problems with processing information. And it is beyond more exaggerated well, than uh, the normal aging process. And when we're talking about that in cats, there's really two major components. Uh, there's a behavioral component. And uh, these are signs that owners are going to notice at home that are changes in their cat. And uh, there is an acronym that's used called DISHAL. And uh, we'll go through what each of those letters stand for. Mm -hmm. So the D is for disorientation. So the cat seeming confused, um, not uh, knowing where they are or, or seeming like, for example, if you move the, the food bowl or things like that, perhaps they're, they're not able to find it. Or even if you don't move it, they're still not able to find their, their food. The I is for interaction, and that's where there's a change in interaction either with the people in the household or other animals in the household. Perhaps two cats got along well and now they're not, or vice versa. The S is for sleep-wake cycle, and this is one of the more common uh, signs that owners notice. Um, Cats, previously when they're sleeping, they're now awake, and when they were previously awake, they're now sleeping. And that unfortunately can mean more nighttime waking, uh, which can be disruptive to everyone in the household, of course. The H is for house soiling, so urinating and or defecating uh, inappropriately in the house, whether they're litter boxed or go outside or a combination, uh, all of a sudden that's changed and they're, they're using uh, the bathroom around the house. The uh, one of the A's is for activity. Most commonly, that's a reduction in activity, so the cat sleeping more. But it also could manifest itself uh, by the animal following the owner around the house more. So the cat actually may appear a little bit more active, but a, a change in activity is what we're looking for. The uh, next A is for anxiety. And most commonly we associate that with separation anxiety. So whenever the cat is left alone, uh, they will often become upset um, or seem a lot more agitated. And then the L is for learning and memory. And those are things like any changes. Let's say you move the litter box in the house, the cat cannot remember where the new location is. So um, that's dish all. There is a movement somewhat in the last couple of years for adding a V into the feline or cat specific uh, acronym for feline cognitive dysfunction. And the V standing for vocalization. Uh, the 
camp that would like to, to make the V part of this acronym uh, has a great point because vocalization by far and away is the most common clinical sign that owners notice. And cats with feline cognitive dysfunction, approximately 50% of them will have an increase in vocalization, so meowing. The camp that doesn't want to add it uh, feels that the vocalization is part of these other things. So for example, vocalization could be a part of uh, anxiety. It could be part of the sleep-wake cycle. So all of a sudden the cat's vocalizing more at night, um, but that's actually a disruption in the sleep-wake cycle, not vocalization on its own. So you may see this acronym changing over the next few years or so, but those are the, the main signs that we look for. And behaviorists are currently adapting, changing, and, and working to um, validate a survey for cats that would that owners would fill out and would uh, based on the score say if a, a cat is more likely or not to have feline cognitive dysfunction so the behavior component is huge uh, the other component that we look at with feline cognitive dysfunction are the neuropathological changes, meaning the actual changes to the brain structure itself. And as you can imagine, this is something that we can only study after, after the cat has passed away by looking at their brains under the microscope. Um, but those are where we're also classifying what does this look like? What does feline cognitive dysfunction look like? Yeah, that's pretty, the vocalization is interesting because I, having been a cat owner, like I have gray hair, so I've had cats for a long time personally and as an internist in practice. And I think a lot of times I can remember one of our old cats in particular doing a lot, a lot of vocalization or I would have clients going, I don't know what they want, right? And I would see them as an internist going, I don't know why your cat's vocalizing because I'm often focused for the on another disease. And that actually brought me to a question for you, Star, which is what other diseases like can look like this or mimic the signs of, of um, this cognitive dysfunction in cats? There's a lot of overlap here. So um, older cats, they, they like to get several diseases uh, very commonly, unfortunately. One is, is chronic kidney disease. Uh, another is hyperthyroidism, uh, where they have an overactive thyroid gland. And both of those can also lead to hypertension or increased blood pressure. Uh, they can also have heart disease that, that can lead to hypertension as well. Uh, and uh, these diseases very much can mimic some of the signs that we talked about. So for example, a cat with kidney disease may use the litter box more frequently. They may be more prone to having accidents. They're more prone to having urinary tract infections, and that could look like inappropriate urination or house soiling. So um, that very easily could, could look exactly the same. Um, hyperthyroidism or the overactive thyroid gland, that can make them be, um, be more active Active, more vocal, more agitated, more aggressive. Uh, they're also hungry all the time. So they have a change there. And so again, a lot of the signs that I previously talked about, identical to, to those clinical signs associated with that disease. Another one that we see in our older cats that I think is, is somewhat um, not talked about that much, nearly as much as we talk about it in dogs at least, is uh, um, osteoarthritis. So uh, joint related changes, and that could change a cat's behavior. Perhaps they're you know, used to being up on top of their cat tree, but it hurts to get up or get down. So they're not doing that anymore. And uh, so the owner could think, oh, they're not as active, but really it's, it's pain that they're having arthritis and it hurts to get up and down. So it's really important that if you're noticing these signs in your cat or have concerns that number one, you're, you're bringing them to your veterinarian uh, and making sure that you're discussing these things and not just attributing it to old age or, um, hey, it's just their kidney disease because it may or may not be related to something else going on like feline cognitive dysfunction because there is such an overlap of clinical signs and the signs that you would see at home with your cat. Okay. And just to be so that I have this clear, feline cognitive dysfunction is really a separate disease, right? Absolutely. So do we actually know how many cats suffer from 
cognitive dysfunction? So this is an area that um, has been looked at recently with, with some large numbers of cats. So um, large surveys uh, have been performed and they found that cats between the ages of 11 and 14, um, about 28%, so almost 30, almost one in three there, uh, will have signs consistent with feline cognitive dysfunction. In cats 15 and older, that number elevates to 50% of cats. And then as you can imagine at each age bracket, it gets uh, a, a larger and larger percentage. Our average um, lifespan of, of a domestic cat is around 14 years uh, of, of age. And so as you can imagine, that is a large number of cats and, and ever increasing with, um, with the improvements in veterinary care and things like that for cats. So it's not a small number by any means. Yeah, that's, I, and I think, uh, at least in my practice, I definitely saw a lot of pretty elderly cats, easily over 17. I've had cats. So, so it sounds like that could be a big number and a possibly, as you alluded to, a, a growing number. Um, I think people who are listening, and I get this question, you probably get this too, are these diseases similar to what we hear about in people like Alzheimer's dementia and the various forms of dementia that are diagnosed in people? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, just to just, uh, explain the vocabulary I'm using. So dementia is an umbrella term. Uh, and that is, is an umbrella term in, that's used in people to describe cognitive decline. Alzheimer's is one form of dementia. It's by far and away the most common. And so that's why we hear, hear that, um, that term quite a bit, but it's not the only type. And depending on the classification and it's growing all the time, um, but there's usually five or six types of dementia that are described. So the Alzheimer's we associate with um, our uh, changes in beta amyloid, our accumulation of beta amyloid and disruptions in tau protein and fibrillary tangles. Those may have been things that you've heard. Um, those are all pathologic changes, meaning when they're actually looking at the brain, they're seeing those changes compared to people that do not have signs consistent with Alzheimer's. There's another type of dementia called vascular dementia. And as the name implies, those are associated with a disruption or a change in blood supply to areas of the brain. What's really interesting in cats is that they're actually showing changes related to both types. So vascular dementia, as well as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so they have both and we have yet to correlate clinical signs. That's that's what one line of our research is doing now. So we have an, an owner-based survey where uh, owners fill out a survey about their cat and changes in behavior. And we're actually then looking at the brain to determine, is there a correlation with the severity of clinical signs the owner's noticing at home and the changes in the brain that we're able to see? And are there changes that fit more with the Alzheimer's type compared to the vascular dementia? And we're trying to differentiate those out right now. But uh, to answer your question succinctly, yes, yes, mm -hmm. cats do have. So same. do you do you see cats as potentially being models for those diseases in people? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's what we're exploring in veterinary medicine across the board. Cats kind of are, are behind. They get dogs uh, have long time been taken to the vet more commonly, get seen more. And um, cats are just really good at hiding their signs as well from their owners. So for a number of reasons, they're, they're a little bit understudied and a little bit underutilized. But absolutely, cats um, would be hopefully a fantastic model. And, and what's been shown so far absolutely supports that. And so, again, our research right now is trying to correlate all of these findings, the behavior changes and the pathological changes together to try and, and put patterns to it. But uh, all of the research to date supports that. Yes. Um, you, we talked about Vishdal uh, earlier, but how do you even diagnose this in cats? Uh, I mean, they're kind of peculiar animals. So how do you go about uh, uh, making a firm diagnosis of, of cognitive dysfunction? 
Great question and somewhat frustrating uh, for owners of cats and, and me as a veterinarian and as a neurologist too. It's what we call a diagnosis of exclusion. So as we previously talked about, a lot of the other diseases that are really common, especially in an aging cat population, can not only mimic, but be exactly the same as the signs associated with cognitive dysfunction. It's important for us to rule those out. So if you notice a change in, in your cat, uh, then you Usually we'll start with basic blood work, looking at the kidney values, um, looking at the white blood cell count, red blood cell count, things like that, making sure that there's no other uh, systemic illness going on. Also, part of that workup should include uh, a T4, which checks the thyroid hormone to make sure the cat is not hyperthyroid or having overactive thyroid gland. Uh, and then also checking up blood pressure to make sure that they're not having hypertension or increased uh, blood pressure. And essentially, if whatever the behavior the cat's doing, whether it's a, a true behavior like increased aggression, or it's something like house soiling, which could be due to a, a number of, of variables, uh, it's just finding out that there's not an, another underlying cause for it. There's nothing else going on that medically explains those signs. And so then it's a diagnosis of, okay, we've ruled out all of these other things, it, need, it must be feline cognitive dysfunction. We're currently, um, the, the second part of our research is working on a biomarker, which would be uh, something that we look at in the blood sample. Um, so uh, a relatively non-invasive test there. And we would are trying to correlate uh, biomarkers with uh, neurodegeneration in cats. So this has been well, well correlated in people. So essentially people with types of dementia have elevated biomarkers compared to uh, elderly people of the same age uh, that don't have signs of dementia. And so we are currently seeing, can we do this in cats? Um, can we even pick up their biomarkers using the, the current assays that are available? And then if so, do they correlate with the severity of clinical signs that the owners are seeing. And so I say all of that because hopefully one day, hopefully soon, um, we'll have a better way to definitively say, yes, this cat or, or your cat has feline cognitive dysfunction um, in, a, in a more definitive medical way than ruling it out. I can see that eventually maybe folding into like a senior cat blood panel, you got right? It. You where, got it. Absolutely. where where we Absolutely. would look at something. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot again because I get this question. So now I'm going to ask you this question, and I get this from my neighbors, pay, you know, my clients. You probably do too. Um, which is to what is the best diet? Right. For, oh, yeah. get for that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we get it at the foundation, right. That's a pretty common question that our, our folks answering phones or dealing with donors get asked a lot. And what do we know anything? Is there some hard science around this or is it anecdotal? Like, like um, what's out there and what, what do you know? And what do you tell people? Yeah, yeah, I, you're right. I do get this question a lot. And it's, it makes sense because it's something that we do for our cats, you know, multiple times a day. So if there's a, a better diet we could give them, that would, would be wonderful. So uh, yes, as I previously mentioned, the this area is behind in cats compared to dogs. So dogs do have, have more targeted diets specifically for brain health. Um, any most diets that are marketed for mature, senior, older, geriatric, whatever the, the term that they may use, um, should include things that are going to support brain health overall. And things that we're specifically talking about are going to be our omega threes, um, antioxidants or free radical scavengers, vitamins E, vitamin C, vitamin B12. Uh, L-carnitine, uh, SAM-E, that's another great one that, that's often added. Um, and uh, different diets may have different portions of those, but that's generally speaking when uh, they're formulating diets for older pets, those are the sorts of things that are going to be added. Something to be careful for are not only additives, but medications and things like that, that are targeted for people, formulated for people, and even dogs may be toxic to cats. So one that's, that's uh, kind of newer for, for dogs is alpha lipoic acid, and that's actually toxic to cats. So um, we have to be careful because again, a lot of these um, 
nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, um, and, and even diets are targeted for dogs. And we may think, oh, dogs, cats, similar, let's just add, give it to the cat, but we can't, can't do that. So you do want to be careful. And if you have any questions about what you're giving your cat, definitely ask your veterinarian. Um, but the, the take home message for that would be don't assume that it's okay for your cat if it's not actually made for cats. Yeah, that's a good reminder, right? That do- uh, cats are not small dogs, which is something Star and I have heard many, many times as we work through our veterinary profession. But it's a good reminder that, right, cats are different in their metabolism and and we don't want to make things worse um so i know we can't give cats sudokus but uh what are some things that we can do to help prevent progression because that's the next thing like that's the second thing i get after diet is well what can i do to prevent or slow down uh cognitive declines so currently uh there are no medications approved or um have even really been properly tested or, or looked at for cats. So um, again, giving the the diet is going to be a great thing uh, to start off with. Otherwise, we're looking at addressing what the symptoms may be. So there's different medications, uh, anti-anxiety medications, uh, even like melatonin. So for example, if if one of the major problems your cat's having is a change in the sleep-wake cycle and they're awake all night long. Um, Perhaps giving melatonin could help with that to help them sleep better. If one of the signs that they're showing is more aggression or they've changed in their behavior, they seem um, more stressed or have separation anxiety, using uh, the pheromone diffusers like feel away, for example, can be really helpful to calm cats. Um, if they are meowing and you're like, are you hungry? What's going on? Using an automatic feeder, um, for example, I have an, an almost 18 year old cat and a six year old cat. And so we recently got my 18 year old cat, uh, an automatic feeder because she was just a little slow to the food bowl. And my younger cat was, was eating all the food. And so he was getting bigger and my older cat was getting smaller. (laughs) Um, and so getting, getting our older cat an automatic feeder where she doesn't have that competition and can go at her, her own will, uh, throughout the day has been helpful. Um, giving a low litter box, as I mentioned earlier, arthritis is something that uh, we don't talk about, about a lot in cats, but they definitely have it uh, as they age. And so getting a litter box with with low or no lip that they have to jump over to get into can be helpful. So those are, are things that you can do to, to change and help your cat with some of the signs. And then also what's been shown to help slow down decline um, as much as possible, because of course we can't reverse it, but we aim to slow it down, would be environmental and behavior enrichment. So giving new toys, um, having them work to get treats by puzzles or games or even hiding treats in, in the house for them to find. Uh, petting them, brushing them, stimulating them in different ways, promoting playing, promoting climbing, exploring, things like that. Those have all been shown, especially in early cognitive decline, to help. I will put a note in here of an exception where if a cat is showing signs consistent with severe cognitive decline, sometimes new things can be stressful. So um, for example, in a a younger cat or a cat with early cognitive decline, having food around in different places could be fun for them to find. In a severely affected cat, that could be stressful. If they're having to look for their food, um, that can be a bit too much. So uh, definitely, you know, vary your, how much you're uh, doing, depending on the the stage your cat is in and uh, how they're responding to the changes that you're making. And again, if you have any questions, you could always ask your veterinarian about that. Um, What are some of the most common misperceptions you hear about cognitive dysfunction and cats that it's your chance to debunk right now? (laughs) (laughs) I think the most common one is that this is not normal aging. And I think that cats are especially difficult for this because one, I I don't know many cats, they do exist, they're out there, but I don't know many that like going to the veterinarian. So um, especially as they get older, you know, like I said, I have an an almost 18 year old cat. So even myself, 
as a veterinarian. Um, she has a, a couple chronic conditions that I have to, to take her in and, and uh, check her blood work for and things. It's stressful for her and for me, uh, you know, getting her into her cat cat box, um, cat carrier to, to get her there. Uh, I worry about stressing her out. I wor worry about her blood pressure and, and all of these things. So if that's part of your hurdle for taking your cat to the vet, your vet can actually give medications to make that easier. So anti-anxiety medications to make that whole process easier for you um, and your cat, <laughs> which for me go hand in hand. Um, and so, you know, taking your cat to the veterinarian, monitoring for changes at home and, and checking in with everyone. So um, everybody's, all, all your family members' relationships with your pets are slightly different. And so, you know, before your, your annual visit to the veterinarian, maybe checking in with everybody and asking, hey, have you noticed any changes with Momo, that's our cat's name. We noticed any changes with Momo, um, you know, recently. And, and I wouldn't dismiss things. Again, don't dismiss them as normal aging. Uh, and, and don't, uh, you know, feel silly bringing them out to your veterinarian because you know your pet better than anyone. And so it's really important that any changes that you note at home, you bring up because they could be um, related to something medical, like we discussed. It, it could be normal aging, or it could be that it's actually feline cognitive dysfunction and, and sometimes integrating these therapies or, or treating them could improve your cat's quality of life uh, and have them live a better quality of life for longer. So that would be the biggest misconception that I'd, I'd like to address is just um, don't dismissing things, uh, you know, don't dismiss things, um, actually paying attention and talking to your veterinarian about them. Star, before we wrap up, uh, you mentioned this earlier, but can we take a little deeper dive into some of the research you're doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are looking at feline cognitive dysfunction in a couple of different ways right now. So what um, what we do is we're having uh, asking owners that have cats that are 12 years of age or older to fill out uh, this survey questionnaire about their cat's behavior. And it was actually developed by a veterinary behaviorist at Purdue. And so um, again, cats over 12 uh, can have this survey. And then uh, cats that uh, are otherwise doing well and, and healthy, we are collecting a little blood sample to test biomarkers. And what these biomarkers are essentially flags uh, within the blood that are uh, symbols of neuronal uh, degeneration. And they've been well established in people, as I mentioned earlier. And so with this line of research, we're looking at a couple of things. One, is it valid in cats? Can we pick them up? Can we pick them up um, consistently, these, these biomarkers? And then number two, do they correlate well with the questionnaire? So for example, if owner describes more severe signs consistent with feline cognitive dysfunction, does that cat also have a significantly elevated uh, degree of biomarker in their blood? And so that's one prong of our project. The, the second uh, stage is looking at the brain pathology. And so whenever cats pass away from whatever reason it might be, um, then uh, they're able to, the owners are able to uh, have them participate in our research. And that's where we're actually looking at the brain. And as I mentioned earlier, trying to look for those differences in the pathology. Are they more consistent with Alzheimer's? Are they more consistent with vascular dementia or both? And then again, correlating those findings with the owner survey or questionnaire and trying to determine what changes show up uh, on the brain or in the brain compared to what the owners are noticing at home. And um, these two parts of the puzzle have been well established. So cats have these, these clinical behavior changes. We know that, and we know that there's pathological changes, but the correlation and connection between the two is, has not been done. And so that's what our research is doing is trying to pair those together to better understand the, the whole process. Okay. So my last question for you, and thanks again for doing all this is <laughs> what is kind of your take home message for people um, when it comes to their cats and um, behavior? 
Yeah, so uh, I'll probably re reiterate what you you asked me a little earlier is, is again, don't dismiss signs. Um, don't dismiss changes uh, because you think it's related to, to their age, getting older. Um, secondly, bring those things to your veterinarian. So talk about them, uh, talk about, you know, what you're seeing because you're your veterinarian may have other ideas for, for what's going on. Um, and again, including the whole family uh, to make sure that you're you're really getting a full view of what's going on with your cat. So that would be my my take home is, is pay attention and don't dismiss things, uh, which I think is, is really easy to do, especially as our animals get get older. Right, right. I think um I think that's a a point well taken for a lot of of disorders in our pets, right? Which is don't yeah. just blow them off for yeah. aging. Well, mm -hmm. thanks again, Star. We really appreciate you joining and talking oh, about feline cognitive dysfunction. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Kahn today. Dr. Kahn received his DVM degree from the University of Florida in 2019, and then he spent a year in a rotating internship at Blue Pearl Pet Hospital right there in Gainesville, um, Florida. Currently, he is a behavior resident at the College of Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University, and he's studying under Dr. Sarah Bennett and Dr. Margaret Gruen. His current research interests include canine and feline cognition, age-related changes in the brain, and novel therapeutic approaches to behavior disorders. And he lives in beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina, with his four cats, one dog, and three axolotls. Did I say that right, yes, Michael? You said that right. <laughs> Welcome, Michael. It's great to have yeah, thanks you. Thanks for having here. me on, Kelly. Um, so I want to begin with a little bit and for a little informally. So tell us, Great. how did you become like, what made you become a veterinarian and then focus on animal behavior? Sure. Yeah. So I actually started out a little unconventionally. So I started out in human medicine and I was actually doing research um, in developing basically uh, psychiatric drugs for people. And I really enjoyed working with the mice, not so much um, interviewing the patients. <laughs> and so I was like, well, maybe I would be really good at veterinary medicine instead. So kind of took that next step, went to Florida to do veterinary medicine. And um, basically as we were taking classes, I didn't know an animal behaviorist was a thing until we had our first year of courses and was like, wow, this is what I've been doing for the past three years already. And it was really interesting for me. And I felt like I could apply a lot of my skills um, to, to the actual practice of medicine with animal behavior. Um, so then I did a few uh, courses and did a few uh, rotating uh, specialty internships. And then I decided that this was definitely the course for me. That's actually how I met uh, Dr. Gruen and Dr. Bennett was during one of my rotations out and I liked it so much in Raleigh, I wanted to stay. So they were kind enough to have me and kind of take me under their wing. Well, it's great. Yeah, I think for a lot of folks, uh, they see some animal behavior. And of course we know some about animal behavior because people have been quote training animals for centuries, but it's really, the field's really taken off, I think in the last couple of decades. And I wanted to ask you, so that brings us to the reason we're here today, which is talk to talk about cognitive decline. And mm -hmm. I know it's kind of a big question, but what, what do we mean when we say cognitive decline? Yeah, and that is that is a really interesting question to start with, I would say. <laughs> so cognitive decline is a normal aging process that happens in the brain. Um, so when we think about cognitive decline, our brains just aren't processing information as fast as possible. When we get concerned with it as a, from a behavior perspective is when does that function actually start impairing the quality of life and impairing the normal everyday behaviors for, for a dog or a cat? Okay, so it's more of when we think about it, it's a little bit more of a clinical, we should think of it clinically, not just, it sounds like small lapses or or changes that we may see. I talked about when I was, I don't even want to say when I was in school, but you guys can see the gray hair. So, you know, <laughs> it's been a while. We didn't even talk about cognitive decline in animals. Like, I don't think it was even recognized, though, as I was in practice, sometimes people would go, you know, as my dog or cat's getting older, they're exhibiting some weird behavior. Can you give a little 
history about when like this was actually recognized and people said, yes, this is not, this is a thing in, in dogs. Yeah. So kind of as you alluded to earlier, the field of behavior in itself is relatively new. So when we're looking at veterinary specialties, behavior is one of the newest specialties that's kind of emerging and still growing as a profession. Um, and part of behavior is this sense of cognitive decline or cognitive dysfunction. When we look at the history of it, in the early 1990s is when um, veterinarians really started looking at the true behavioral changes that are happening as dogs and cats are getting older really started with dogs to begin with. Um, so Dr. Mil or Dr. Milgram and Dr. Landsberg were the first two to really start looking at those behaviors and scientifically quantifying what's actually going on with these dogs. And they published a series of reports that um, included what are these behavior changes that they're seeing and how are these actually related to behavior changes that are happening in people. And then in 2001, we had our first medication and still our only medication that's FDA approved for treatment of cognitive dysfunction. And from that point, we've kind of gathered more and more information. We've added to what is cognitive dysfunction and kind of further refined it. And that's what we're still trying to research today is what exactly is going on with these pets. I don't know if you know this answer, but does anyone have a sense of how many dogs suffer from cognitive decline? Sure. And that I would say it probably is going to change on a year to year basis, depending on who you ask and what the most recent data that comes out is. The reason it's so flexible is that our definition of what is cognitive dysfunction and what cognitive decline is, is still a little bit fuzzy. So the most recent study, at least that I'm aware of, was by Dr. McQuitty in, in last year in 2022. So they estimated that about dogs that were eight or older about 8% of those dogs had some uh, clinical signs of cognitive decline. And then in dogs 17 years and older, they saw at least 80% of those dogs had some form of cognitive dysfunction. And so the thing that all of the studies have had in common are that as these dogs are aging, usually starting at around seven or eight years old, but then going to nine, 10, it only gets exponentially more the dogs that are experiencing some form of cognitive dysfunction. I don't know if you can comment on more about, uh, because I think people listening understand that dogs come in a variety of sizes and we typically sure. often think of old, older dogs. Dogs that live to 17 are small breed dogs. So is the age of decline related to trying to average big and little dogs or is there something are little dogs more likely to develop yeah that's a really good question and it's one that we're currently investigating now so at nc state we have a longitudinal study that we're doing where we're looking at all types of dogs and how they're aging and their performance in various cognitive tasks as well as um, some other clinical measures but what the other studies have found is that is actually the absolute age of the dog is the bigger predictor of cognitive decline and cognitive dysfunction. So we don't think of a lot of like Irish wolfhounds as getting cognitive dysfunction or getting dementia as they get older, probably because they're not living as longer as the Chihuahua or the Shih Tzus who are living to 15, 17 years old. Oh, so that's really interesting. So it could be a factor of actual time. Yeah, exactly. That the the true age of the dog that maybe the maybe their brains or their neurons in their brains have some some lifespan that is more true to the the actual age rather than the size of the dog. Wow, that's fascinating because we don't always see that right with other right. diseases <laughs> of dogs. Um, so uh, moving. You know, you talked a little bit about this, and I get this question a lot. You probably hear it too, which is is what we see in dogs like Alzheimer's, like sometimes yeah. people call it Alzheimer's. We know a lot more about dementia in people. We know there are lots of forms. Do we have a sense of, of the pathology and the, if there are analogous diseases? Sure. So I would say that research is definitely still ongoing, but um, that was how the original interest in cognitive dysfunction actually started was we wanted to look at these dogs as a model for human Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a very specific part of human dementia. So it accounts for roughly 60 to 80% of all dementia cases in people. 
Um, but there's, as you said, a lot of different types of dementia in people and dogs. We just have cognitive dysfunction syndrome. And it's a collection of a lot of different uh, signs and symptoms that we're seeing. We do know, from a histopathology perspective, that they have the same accumulation of waste products in the brain that Alzheimer's patients do. And they form these big plaques and big clumps of protein that kind of impair how the neurons are talking to each other in the brain. And that's one of the theorized methods as to what is actually happening with these patients. And the other really similar thing is that dogs are kind of unique in the animal world and that they share a lot of the same environments that people do. So when we think about laboratory animals like mice and rats, they don't necessarily share the same social environment and the same uh, challenges that people do on a day-to-day -day basis, which makes them a kind of difficult model uh, for Alzheimer's. But dogs are very social animals and they share a lot of those same environments with us, making them a really good model when we're looking at various behavioral changes that are happening with them. Okay. And what are the signs yeah. of cognitive decline in dogs? What does that look like exactly? So I would say this is an ever-growing list <laughs> and it seems to get larger every time um, we come up with a new acronym, but the current acronym is DISH-AL. Um, and so those correspond to disorientation, changes to social interactions, changes to the sleep-wake cycle, changes in house soiling, changes in activity level, increases in anxiety, and decreased ability to learn. Okay. And, and that's a lot. Like, how do you, it seems like it would be hard to make this diagnosis. Well, how do you make a diagnosis if someone comes in and they suspect this is happening with their dog? Sure. So I really wish there was a, a blood test or something that we could do that was really easy that said, yes, your pet has cognitive dysfunction. Here's a medication. We can put it on, make everything better. Unfortunately, there's still a lot that's unknown about this disease, so we really rely on owner histories. One tool, or a couple tools that we have to actually help are in the forms of surveys that have been validated um, through using it through several dogs. So there's two out there right now. First one is called the Canine Dementia Scale, or the KD Scale. And the older one is the CCDR, or Canine Cognitive Dysfunction Rating. Both of those ask a series of questions to the owner and try to get them to quantify how frequently they're seeing these changes in behavior. And at the end of the survey, the numbers get totaled and we'll put the dog into a category, whether it's a normal, mild cognitive impairment, moderate or severe cognitive impairment. And then the veterinarian can make a decision based on those clinical signs and any physical observations that they're seeing does this patient uh, meet the criteria for cognitive dysfunction and do we need to treat it? So what are some of the behaviors? Uh, we have some video that you brought, right. which hopefully people are going to be watching, but tell us a little bit about some of the behavior that people might see with a yeah. dog that's starting to have problems. So some of the more noticeable signs are going to be waking up in the middle of the night and kind of wandering around the house aimlessly. So we see this very frequently that they're unable to sleep through the night. They might get up, go to the back door and bark, but when we let them outside, they don't go to the bathroom. They just come back inside. Uh, there could be times where they're going throughout the day and they're just circling around the house, not really knowing where they're going, or they're getting stuck in like a bathroom or behind a curtain. Anything like that could be a sign of cognitive dysfunction. Other big signs that we can see are, um, again, those house soiling patterns. So we let them outside, they don't go two minutes after we bring them inside and they go to the bathroom on the floor. Okay. Those changes are definitely signs that we can see of, of something happening with, with their brain. Are there any diseases? I mean, we're talking about this as a disease in and of itself, and I understand that it is, but are there other diseases in dogs that may predispose them to this or not? Yeah, so we don't know any that might predispose them to developing cognitive dysfunction, but there are some that we're currently researching that could um, be risk factors. So the big one right now is actually looking at dental disease. So it seems a lot of these dogs who have a pretty severe dental disease or inflammation in their gums that actually are uh, harboring a type of bacteria that is associated with cognitive decline. And we're seeing that the more that these patients have 
um, some kind of chronic or systemic inflammation, the worse that their brain overall performs. And some of that is kind of like a chicken and the egg question of, is their cognitive decline causing them to have other health problems? Or are these other health problems making it so they're not able to take care of their, or their body's not able to take care of their brain the way that it should? So that actually brings me to a good question for you, which is, are is there anything pet owners can do? Like, do we know anything they can do to prevent or delay this kind of thing? It sounds like maybe dental care might be up there. Yeah, so I would say maintaining um, a healthy lifestyle and keeping up with the pet's overall quality of health is going to be one of the most important things. Big thing that I see missed with a lot of older dogs is pain. So chronic pain, whether it's in the mouth or joints or back, can all lead to disruptions in that sleep-wake cycle, which is really important for maintaining brain health. And then that's when I can see dogs really start to spiral um, and the cognitive dysfunction get a lot worse is when they have these kind of chronic underlying pain. So paying attention to that is a big one. And the next one is keeping them mentally engaged. So just like people, the more we can have the dogs and cats use their brain, the stronger it's going to be and the more active their brain is going to be. So I always recommend doing kind of low, um, physically in intense exercise. So things like going for sniff walks, letting the dog set the pace. One thing that we're researching right now is that the, while the dogs and cats, their hearing and their eyesight might be some of the first things to go as far as their senses, their sense of olfaction declines, but not to the level that the eyesight or hearing might. So going for those sniff walks is a really, really good way to engage one of the senses that they do have. And it takes a lot of brain power to actually process those smells. So it's really engaging and mentally taxing on those dogs. And something that is really simple for owners to do and um, really rewarding for the dog. Oh, that's really good to know. So a sniff, I didn't realize that olfaction like really stimulated your brain so much. So that sounds, that sounds interesting other things that you recommend people to use? Yeah, so there are some supplements that are available. Um, big one, I would say, is a product called Senolife. Mainly, this has a lot of antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids. Again, this is going to promote overall body health, but also help that brain chemistry and make sure that the brain is more efficient at clearing out those waste products so they don't build up. Okay. And early on, you mentioned there is one medication approved. Um, yes. Even when I was in practice, it was just coming into use. Uh, what's the data on that? Um, I know it's yeah. kind of the only thing we have, right? But but what's the data to support it? Yeah. So the medication is Selegiline or the brand name is Anapril. But what this medication does is in what's called a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It has a few different functions, but its main way that it's working is it's actually preventing the breakdown of a lot of the neurotransmitters in the brain. When we prevent the breakdown of those neurotransmitters, it's basically stopping a lot of the oxidative damage that happens. So normal dogs, normal people, normal cats are able to break down the neurotransmitters, flush out all the waste products, and kind of resume normal function. Dogs with impairment have a lot harder time reducing those metabolic end products. So what this does is basically delay how quickly those uh, neurotransmitters are getting broken down. It also functions as an anxiolytic because those neurotransmitters are really important for maintaining the overall brain health. And sometimes our pets need a little boost to the amount that they have in their system. And selegiline is kind of attacking the problem from two different fronts. So I, I'm going to put you on the spot because okay. I get put on the spot all the time, all which right. is my neighbors will come up to me and go, what is the best diet to, oh, gosh, for okay. my older dog <laughs> or to prevent cognitive declines? I'm sure you've heard it. Like, what do you, yes. what do you tell people? So there are a lot of diets out there. And I would say this is, this is definitely one of the big questions we get asked all the time. It doesn't matter for aging dogs or or for your normal pet dog is what is the best diet? I like to go with the diets that have more research behind them and that have shown that they're effective for dogs of that age group and might be effective for specific diseases. And we can think of cognitive dysfunction as an actual disease. So there are two prescription diets out there. The first one is by Hills and it's called Hills BD or brain diet. 
Um, this diet is full of antioxidants and omega-3s and is really close to what we're seeing in a lot of senior diets now. So those omega-3 fatty acids are promoting joint health, promoting brain health. And again, those antioxidants are helping us not build up a bunch of waste products in the body and in the brain. The NeuroCare diet is a little different in the fact that it is it's providing the brain a different energy source. So the brain can only use either glucose or ketones. And those are kind of the only products it can use for energy. A lot of our food might contain long chain acids or fatty acids or other carbohydrates and glucose is consumed really, really quickly by the brain. What we want to do with it or the thought with the neuro care diet is can we provide the brain with long lasting energy through ketones and kind of give it an alternate energy source so that way it always has the products that it needs to do its function. And we can actually see that that pr it promotes brain health overall. And by doing a combination of supplements and diet, we can actually see prolonging the quality of life in these patients. So we don't usually see them revert to completely back to normal to what they were when they were five. But through using the medication, through using the supplements, we can see a dog have several years of quality life and or continued brain health rather than seeing a more rapid decline than if we were to just feed them a normal everyday diet and not supplement them with anything. That, that's really, I think, helpful. And I think your point is well taken. And as an internist, I'm going to put in a plug. It, it can get complicated if you have a com a, another disease. So make sure you work with your veterinarian about it. I also use food puzzles with my dog. So yeah. she eats every day out of a, you know, she eats all the time out of some kind of food puzzle. Are those good? Or is that just like people selling me stuff? <laughs> Oh, I, I adore food puzzles. I recommend it for dogs of all ages because, again, it keeps them engaged. It makes mealtime last a little bit longer. So they're maybe they're chewing their food a little bit more. They're less going to be prone to bloat or kind of mm -hmm. swallowing things um, whole. But for the elderly dog, we want to make sure that it's a puzzle that they can do. Um, what's really important is some of these dogs might have a lower what I would call frustration tolerance or if something's too hard, they might give up on it and feel defeated. So we want to make sure it's a puzzle that they can accomplish, but still takes a little bit amount of work. And there's a lot of varying difficulty for things where they have like a maze bowl that just takes them sticking their tongue into it, licking the kibble out. It's really easy, but they still have to have some dexterity involved to something more challenging, like the slide puzzles where they have to manipulate several objects to actually get the treat out. And that's really going to be dependent on the pet and what they're capable of in that moment. That's a good point about the frustration, watching the frustration level um, for these. That's It's like the difference between the Monday New York Times, right? And the Sunday New exactly. York Times crossword puzzle. You don't want to get... Like they're not, not every puzzle is for every dog. <laughs> um, and you really have to uh, take some experimentation to figure out which ones your dogs actually like and which ones they're capable to do. Right, right. So that's a good good reminder. And some of them are more per, uh, better for small dogs, I think, versus like there's a certain yeah. dexterity level with some puzzles that my big Labrador, she she can't. Yes. It's not going to happen <laughs> unless it's like flipping the board over till it breaks and right. Yeah. But she can't do certain things. So that's good. Good to know. What are some of the misperceptions you hear, Michael, of, that people can make a comment or even with your colleagues in the in the vet hospital? Sure. So some of the big misconceptions I see are one that um, the dog might be doing something out of spite or because they're angry or they're old and crotchety. Um, the big thing that I want to get across is that these pets are, they're struggling with their brain overall and remembering to do specific things. And they might not understand exactly what all the behaviors they're doing. They're not trying to get trapped in the bathroom or they're not intentionally going to the bathroom on the floor um, to spite the owner. It's basically, they might not remember what's going on outside. There are very specific parts of the brain that control the bladder and control the urge to go to the bathroom. And if those parts of the brain are damaged, that pet might not have the capability to actually make the conscious decision to go outside. And it's not necessarily due to a lack of training or anything like that. So the big thing I see is people will start punishing their dog actually for going to the bathroom inside the house and for barking at night or for getting them up at night. 
And a big thing to remember is that these dogs are, are mentally very fragile right now. And by punishing them, we're actually increasing their anxiety and increasing their fear, which we know is one of the big symptoms of cognitive dysfunctions. They're one of the big signs of cognitive dysfunction. And we don't want to make that worse. Um, in general, I would say punishment's not recommended as a training method for most behavior problems. Um, but uh, in these cases, we want to be especially sure that we're making their life as predictable as possible. And that if we do have a problem where they're urinating inside the house or defecating inside the house, how can we fix the dog's environment so we can make that less of a possibility? Can we use a diaper on them? Can we take them out more regularly? Is there an area of the house where they don't urinate? And basically setting up the setting the dog up for success rather than punishing them for something they might not know that they're doing. And as we wrap up, uh, Michael, what is your take home message for people who may be th uh, thinking about this or maybe they're recognizing signs as you're talking with their their dogs? Like what what would you tell people your advice to them? Yeah. So my take home message would be that if they're concerned with their pet and they feel like their dog just might not be acting right as they're getting older, or they're seeing some of these behavior changes that are a little worrisome. First step is always talk to your veterinarian. Um, bringing them in for a physical is going to be one of the best things you can do for them. Getting that annual blood work is going to be one of the best ways we can monitor their overall health. Because again, if we keep the body healthy, it's a lot easier to keep the brain healthy. And we can kind of promote that, um, the overall systemic health of the dog that way. Apart from going to your veterinarian, the other thing I would recommend is keep your dog engaged. Just because they're slowing down and just because they can't go on that five mile run with you anymore, doesn't mean that they can't do other activities. Going for those sniff walks, providing them food puzzles, uh, engaging them in other kind of low impact ways are going to be ways that we can keep that brain moving, keep the body moving. And again, that's going to prolong their overall quality of life and prolong their overall health. Well, Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. I think we're going to be heading to the Q&A portion of the program now. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on, Kelly. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I I got some We've got some great questions here. Both Star and Michael are joining us tonight. And I'm going to try to, there's a lot of questions uh, and I'm going to try to combine them as much. I see, again, some themes. If it's something very specific to your individual pet, we might not get to it because we've just got so many questions tonight. So I'm going to have Michael and Star, if you can come up front. Here's Star. Hi, Star. Hi, Michael. So thanks for those great lectures. They were so wonderful. So how about if I start, I'm going to actually start with something that I got, we got sent in to us. And I will put either Michael or Star can answer this because I don't think we know this, which is does dement like dementia or cognitive decline in and of itself decrease lifespan? That's a great question. Um, as far as the cats go, we don't know that yet. You're right. <laughs> I'll let Michael speak about dogs, but yeah, we don't have enough data yet to determine if, if it actually is shortening um, a, a cat's lifespan. And part of the the problem that can come in with veterinary studies specifically when we're talking about decreasing lifespan is euthanasia, which is always a hard part to talk about. Um, but since a lot of this is, is behavior and you could feel like your, um, you know, pet isn't quite the same anymore, that could potentially lead to, to early euthanasia. Um, but definitely something that we need to look into a bit more for, for cats. Yeah, and it's kind of the same evidence for dogs as well, is that we don't necessarily have um, dogs who have cognitive dysfunction live a shorter life, especially because it's kind of an end-of-life uh, disease that usually develops. Um, I will say usually when this disease does onset, if left untreated, there usually is a fairly rapid decline in the pets. So often for patients I've seen, usually I see about um, six months to a year before we start seeing pretty significant cognitive decline to the point where we do have quality of life concerns for the pets and ultimately owners have to make decisions. 
Um, but it is very variable. And I want to be very clear that this disease can be very different for, for various pets. Some pets are diagnosed very early on at seven, eight years old. And they stay at the same level of cognitive dysfunction for a very long time. Other pets are diagnosed at 12, 13, and by um, a year and a half or a year, they're um, very much declined. And it's a very, and we still don't know what those risk factors are. And we, it's very difficult to predict what the end outcome is going to be for a lot of pets. Okay. And that actually, that's a good uh, lead in, Michael and Star, to something that I saw come up tonight and actually that people submitted, which is what can I do maybe in a young animal? Is there any evidence? Like when do I start supplementing? So maybe I'll start with you, Star, on cats and then Michael can do dogs. That is a great question and one that we need to look into. I think there's more for dogs <laughs> than, than there is for cats right now as far as evidence for this, um, like what Michael was alluding to in his talk, dental health and things like that. We have yet to find that in cats that, for example, giving a, a supplement, whatever it might be, is going to be more beneficial. Uh, as I mentioned in my part of the talk, there are diets that are formulated for our senior geriatric older animals, but no one, uh, to my knowledge, has studied, is there a benefit in giving a younger cat this sort of supplementation earlier, or is it going to uh, delay or even prevent uh, cognitive decline later on. Um, so I, I'm sure that those questions will be answered as we start to discover and learn more about this disease, but it's all fairly new, uh, especially in cats, the, the research, the disease is not, it's been there for a long time, but the research and the evidence that we have is, is very new. Yeah. And one of the, I think one of the challenges of doing a study like that is we're looking at really early factors um, in, in animals for animals who may or may not develop cognitive dysfunction. I don't believe there's been a study kind of on that scale of looking at really early life and following those animals all the way through because we don't know which ones are going to develop cognitive dysfunction. Um, that's part of what we're doing at NC State right now is looking at older dogs and seeing which ones are developing cognitive dysfunction and looking at other risk factors that might be able to help us predict a little bit earlier and see which of those dogs do need a little bit more health. But um, in general, I would say the biggest thing to do is just keep screening for overall body health. So getting regular checkups from your veterinarian, eating a balanced diet, having plenty of activity, maintaining good mental health for pets. So that means uh, making sure that we don't have excess anxiety and making sure that we are in a, a comfortable home, meeting all of our environmental needs. That's going to be really important to maintaining the longevity and good quality of life. And uh, I'm going to jump in here, even though I am not a behaviorist, and put in a plug for our Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, which mm -hmm. Morris Animal mm -hmm. Foundation is doing. And for folks who don't know, we're following 3,000 Golden Retrievers through their lifetime. Because Golden Retrievers get a high, have a high rate of cancer, it, it's at its core, it's a cancer study. But we are also collecting data and have from the beginning on behavior. And recently we introduced, oh, two years ago now, people uh, now answer additional cognitive questions because the dogs were about seven or eight years of age. So, and we also have a initiative where, this is gonna sound really gross guys, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We're actually collecting brains. People can opt in to have brains, their brains collected at, at when they die and sent to someone at, uh, to the Mayo Clinic actually in Arizona to look at pathology changes in the brain. And we've got this cognitive data, right? That we've been doing. So we may, we're not gonna help cats uh, very much, but we may actually be able to answer some of the dog stuff, right? Like what age did maybe people start saying, hey, stuff was happening with my dog. What were, we know what they're eating. We know what their exposures are. So again, it's not the primary focus of the study, but we may be able to answer some of these questions in the future. Another question I got, which actually I'm kind of interested in for both Star and Michael, is a couple of people asked about a genetic component mm -hmm. to this. 
Yeah. So in cats, you can probably already guess my answer. We don't know yet, <laughs> but, um, you know, the link there, there has been shown to be a link in people. And so far what we know in cats, uh, they are a really good model for, for studying the human disease. So I think as we collect more and more data, we'll be able to establish if there's a genetic link or not. My inclination is that there probably will be, uh, but it hasn't been shown yet because we're just so, so new in this field for cats. Yeah, my, my answer is going to echo Star as well in that um, the questions you're getting are excellent research questions and questions that really need to be answered. Um, we know that there is a genetic model in rats. Um, so there are rats that are bred to develop Alzheimer's and cognitive dysfunction. Um, and those don't necessarily translate to our dogs and cats, but it does provide some evidence that there's probably some uh, genetic factors in there that we just haven't necessarily uncovered yet. Um, again, usually we're seeing this as a function of absolute age rather than size of dog or um, breed of dog that we're seeing that the older these dogs are getting, the more likely they are to develop cognitive dysfunction. Um, so whether that is a factor of their genetics or just a factor of this is how dogs age, we're still answering that question. Okay. Um, we're, we're getting short on time, but I have to ask this because this was a fun question somebody submitted, which is about cognitive declines in other species. Like they were specifically asking about llamas and alpacas because they have llamas, but they asked about horses. I mean, do we know anything about these other species at all? So I kind of answered a little bit about mice and rats and kind of those laboratory models. I would say other species... Theoretically, any species with a, a cortex can develop cognitive dysfunction because that's where we're seeing the lesions form in the brain. Um, but I'd say most of the research is definitely focused right now on cats, dogs, rats, and mice. Um, the big reason is that, and as Star said at the beginning of her presentation, you know, cats are far behind dogs right now and where that research is. And right now the dogs are catching up to people. So people and the research in human dementia is actually really leading the way. And then veterinary medicine is following behind, trying to apply as much as we can to our species. Um, so definitely, I think as we kind of figure out what's going on with cognitive decline and get more answers, I'm sure we're going to see it start popping up in a lot more species. Okay. And to end with, I'll give you guys each a chance to plug if you have any research. I've had a couple people asking about, can I be in this project? And they asked about STARS research. So what are you guys doing? Are you recruiting? Are you not? Where, where are you at with that right now? Yeah, for our studies, and I talked a little bit about them, um, they're both, uh, I'm at the University of Wisconsin, as you mentioned, Kelly, and so both of them are at the University of Wisconsin. Um, one of them is a biomarker study, so we're screening kitties that are 12 years old and, and older uh, with we're doing basic blood work, we're checking their thyroid, we're checking their blood pressure, we're checking their urine, we're trying to find do they have other comorbidities or other things going on. We're having um, asking the owners to fill out a questionnaire about their cat's behavior at home. And then we're collecting a little sample of blood uh, plasma specifically that we're checking biomarkers for. And there's four major biomarkers that we're looking for. Um, and these have been well established in human medicine and correlated with cognitive decline. And so that's one of our studies. Um, unfortunately, you need to be in the, the vicinity and bring your kitty to the University of Wisconsin uh, School of Veterinary Medicine in order for uh, your kitty to participate in that study. Um, the second half of our study is the uh, same questionnaire that we're using, uh, but it's, as, as you mentioned, Kelly, looking at the brain. So where it's what we call a post-mortem study after the kitty has, has passed away. Uh, we are looking at the brain in, in really great detail to try and understand uh, the pathology, what is exactly there. And so we can name it and, and correlate it with uh, the human versions of dementia, what kinds do the cats have. 
And then our step, what hasn't been done before is we're correlating that with the owner's questionnaire so that we can say, these are the, the type of brain changes we see in a normal aging cat without signs of cognitive dysfunction. And then these are the changes that we see in a cat with mild, moderate, and severe cognitive dysfunction signs at home. And so hopefully we'll be able to, the, the kind of end goal, um, rather than, than just naming things, is to ultimately come up with better treatments, right? That's what we want. Um, so once we know what's there, then hopefully we can design medication supplements in the future that, uh, to answer your one of your first questions, mm -hmm. that we can actually try to prevent it, right? That's what our, our ultimate goal. So ultimately, we come up with medications to treat first and then come up with, with uh, medications and, and nutraceuticals and things to prevent it down the line. Um, we have had some cases actually uh, be able to send, uh, they've had their, their veterinarian assist and, and help sending uh, the brain specifically to partake in the study. So if that's something that you're interested in uh, and having your cat participate in, you can definitely talk with your veterinarian and they can contact us um, and we'll, we'll have our contact information and we are happy to, to see if that's actually possible to get them uh, to be enrolled in the study. And if they want more information, they're always, I'm happy to, for them to contact us as well. If you'd like more information about any of the studies that we have going on right now. Michael, what do you have going on? Sure, so right now NC State is uh, has an ongoing study um, called the Longitudinal Neuroaging Study. I don't believe we are re currently recruiting any more dogs into the study, but um, right now I think there's about 50 or 60 dogs that we're tracking over kind of their senior and geriatric um, lifespan. And we do cognitive testing on those dogs every six months, as well as doing blood work and taking some biomarkers and trying to associate those with owner surveys. So we're still putting all of that data together and putting um, and seeing if we can find any correlations or any risk factors for dogs who are developing cognitive dysfunction um, and trying to put a more complete picture of what these dogs look like. Um, overall, though, if people are in the North Carolina area and are concerned with their pet and what would like some answers or would like to have a consultation. The, the behavior service at the veterinary hospital does see patients and this is one of the areas that we do address with owners. And at a consultation, what we'll do is essentially try to set that pet's life up for success, be it medications or supplementations and as well as environmental enrichment. Um, and trying to mitigate all of the known risk factors that we have and trying to extend that the quality of life that that pet has. Oh, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We're short on time, but I know there are some questions we didn't answer. Some of this we will put in the show notes and it will be on our YouTube channel. So there's more Sound Animal Foundation YouTube. Give us a little bit of time to get it up, but I'll try to get some of the resources. And again, a big thanks and a round of applause for Dr. Star Cameron, Dr. Michael Kahn. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks everyone out there for uh, participating. It was great. We appreciate it.